Starship Mega Rocket, the world's largest and most powerful, was sent into space by SpaceX on the 14th of March, 2024. It reached orbital speed in a historic third test flight from South Texas. It was a glorious event. Hundreds of spectators, rocket launch chasers, and fans gathered along the shores of South Padre Island and nearby areas to witness the flight of the biggest rocket ever built. Starship lifted off at 9.25 a.m. EDT from SpaceX's manufacturing and test launch facilities near Boca Chica Beach. According to the company, the launch happened on the 22nd anniversary of SpaceX's founding in 2002. Unfortunately, neither the Starship vehicle itself nor the Super Heavy booster managed to survive all the way through to the intended splashdown. And still, SpaceX representatives claimed that the test flight achieved quite a few of its main goals during the flight. It went like this. The dim morning sky was brightly lit by the ignition of Starship's 33 first-stage Raptor engines. Soon, the vehicle was shrouded in plumes of dust and smoke. A mere seconds later, the 400-foot-tall rocket lifted off the ground and started its climb skyward. This launch, Integrated Flight Test 3, was Starship's third test mission. The first and second launches didn't end well. Both vehicles detonated before completing their goals. On the bright side, data collected by those first flights helped SpaceX engineers prepare Starship for the successful launch. The improvements included the implementation of a hot staging technique. When it's used, the upper stage engines begin firing before the spacecraft's first stage booster, the very super heavy we spoke about earlier, separates completely. This hot staging maneuver turned out to be a success. But back to the Mega Rockets launch. Already high in the sky, Starship's two stages separated. It happened around 2 minutes and 45 seconds after the liftoff. The 165-foot-tall upper stage spacecraft continued onward to space. As for Super Heavy, it began preparations for redirecting its trajectory. The post-staging burn was supposed to be followed by a landing burn above the Gulf of Mexico minutes later. But apparently, the engines of Super Heavy didn't reignite as planned, which, sadly, led to the loss of the booster. Specialists from SpaceX are going to go through data to find out the reasons for this issue. Starship is built to be fully reusable. SpaceX plans to land and relaunch Super Heavy boosters, just like it does with its Falcon 9 rockets. In the future, two large arms attached to Starship's launch tower will be catching Super Heavy after it returns for landing. This time, though, it was supposed to splash down in the Gulf. But what happened to the upper stage of the spacecraft? After separating, it continued flying for some time. But it didn't even try to go into a full orbit. Instead, the space vehicle entered a suborbital coast phase while soaring above Earth. SpaceX hoped to use this phase to demonstrate two of the spacecraft's flight systems – the reignition of the Raptor engines and the transfer of cryogenic fuel between tanks. Afterward, the spacecraft was to splash down in the Indian Ocean a bit more than an hour after launch. Unfortunately, SpaceX lost contact with Starship during re-entry. SpaceX has lots of plans that involve Starship. For example, the company hopes to use this space vehicle to launch the next generation of Starlink Internet satellites. Equipment needed to build another launch tower has started to arrive at the site. Infrastructure for Starship launches from NASA's Kennedy Space Center is also well underway. The thing is, the faster the company will be ready for the next launch, the sooner NASA will give Starship qualification to carry astronauts. Perhaps reaching NASA's ambitious Artemis III timeline might be a bit unrealistic. But SpaceX is no stranger to fast launch cadences. The company's Falcon 9 rocket has been breaking its own annual launch record year after year. Have you ever wondered why rockets are launched right next to the equator? Or the sea? Or why do we launch them vertically and not like airplanes? Let's answer all the possible, not stupid, questions about rockets. Question 1. How does the Earth affect the rocket's launch? Let's remember some school physics. The gravity of the Earth is incredibly strong. 
To overcome this force, we need to develop a huge speed. Fortunately, rockets are capable of developing it, but it would be much more difficult if the Earth itself didn't help it. The Earth rotates around the Sun at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour. Very fast, to put it mildly. And we are all moving with it. So getting off the Earth is like getting out of a moving car. For some time, the rocket will move along our planet by inertia. It's like a helpful push. The rocket takes off from Earth at a certain speed already, and then it just needs to accelerate a bit more with the help of its fuel. By the way, this isn't the only scientific trick in launching rockets. To get to the maximum benefit from this push, they're launched into Earth's orbit from west to east. Why? Because the Earth rotates from west to east, of course. This way, the rocket receives maximum inertia. Question 2. Why are rockets launched next to the equator? The answer is related to the previous question. Believe it or not, the Earth's surface is moving faster at the equator. The school lied to us a little. The Earth isn't perfectly round. Rather, it's a flattened ellipse. And the equator is the widest point on our planet. Now, what is speed? It's the distance divided by time. And since the distance at the equator is the largest, about 25,000 miles, then the rotation speed there will be higher. So, imagine that you and your friend were standing at two different points of the Earth. You are at the equator, and your friend is closer to the North Pole. After standing there for the entire day, you would fly more miles than your friend, which technically means that you moved faster. So, yep, the rotation speed at the equator is higher. Naturally, it's most profitable for us to launch rockets from places where the initial thrust velocity will be as high as possible. And launching from the equator causes the spacecraft to move almost 300 miles per hour faster. Question 3. How do scientists choose the places for the launch pads? Rockets are gigantic, complex monsters weighing several thousand pounds. Needless to say, dozens of errors may occur during startup. Probably the most dangerous one is a mid-flight failure. That's when something goes wrong in a rocket that's still in the sky. If the burning debris falls to the Earth, it may cause a huge disaster. Now, let's look at a map of the location of launch pads in the world. You can see that many of them are located near the coast. For example, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, USA, or the Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota, India. That's the way to minimize and ideally eliminate altogether the risk of debris falling on your head. If something goes wrong during the launch, it will fall into the ocean waters, far from densely populated areas. And yeah, there are a bunch of launch pads located far from the sea. That's because many other things also play a role in choosing the location. For example, the availability. The launch pad should be ideally accessible from land, air, and sea. Question 4. Wait, doesn't Florida have crazy weather? Why did they choose this state? For more than 70 years, NASA has been launching rockets from Cape Canaveral, Florida. It's because Florida has a very humid and tropical climate. There are more thunderstorms a year than in any other place. This can greatly interfere with rocket launches. It's very dangerous. Moreover, one time it actually happened. In 1987, lightning struck an AC-67 rocket before takeoff. Its systems failed and eventually the rocket was destroyed. Fortunately, there were no people on board. Another big weather threat is hurricanes. And yes, they also happen in Florida more often than in any other state. But despite all this, NASA still chose this cursed place to launch their rockets. Why? Well, probably because all the crazy things, including rocket launches, must happen in Florida. But on a serious note, before NASA moved to Cape Canaveral, rockets were launched from another place, from the White Sands test site located in New Mexico. Back then, since White Sands was located in a remote area of the country, everything was more or less safe. If the rockets had fallen, they wouldn't affect or destroy anything. But as time went on, our technologies developed. The rockets got bigger and needed much more space for their launches. As a result, the danger zone also increased. White Sands was just 26 miles from Las Cruces, New Mexico. 
and 70 miles from El Paso, Texas. In other words, it was surrounded by settlements. Therefore, scientists began to look for safer places. The East Coast seemed like the best option. Can you guess why? Not only is the East Coast closer to the equator, but it's also located near the Atlantic Ocean. We already know that this actually adds plus one to the security. That's why in the 1950s, NASA moved its launches to Florida. The first one was the launch of the Bumper 8 rocket, which took place on July 24, 1950. And then this place became a full-fledged spaceport. Question 5. Why are rockets launched vertically? Rockets are thin, cylindrical tall things that go into space vertically and leave behind a giant cloud of smoke. But why are they launched that way and not like airplanes, for example? Well, this sounds a bit crazy. To implement it, we'd have to make a lot of changes to the current rocket designs. But the most important thing is that it would waste a lot of resources. This may surprise you, but planes and rockets are designed a little differently. The plane's main task is to fly in the atmosphere. The rocket's main task is to leave the atmosphere as soon as possible. Due to the air resistance in the sky, the rocket loses most of its energy while flying. Therefore, we need to make sure that it has left the Earth's atmosphere before its fuel is completely used up. And since it needs a lot more fuel than an airplane, it's easier and more economical to launch it straight up. So it will use a minimum of fuel, just what it takes to kick gravity in the face. Question 6. Why does the trajectory of a rocket change after launch? Remember that we said that the rocket's main task is to escape gravity by any means and reach space? Now forget about it. Technically it's true, but it doesn't show the full picture. The very task of getting into space isn't particularly difficult. The space isn't actually that high. You'll officially become an astronaut if you go to an altitude of about 60 miles above Earth. But it's all about staying in orbit. The orbit is the boundary of two worlds. Here, the gravitational pull of the Earth is still large enough that the rocket doesn't fly into outer space, but at the same time, low enough that it doesn't fall back to Earth. So, if you reach it, there's no need to waste fuel anymore. The spacecraft will simply fly in zero gravity by inertia. If the rocket flies purely in a straight line, it will simply fly into outer space. To enter orbit, it needs to fly in an arc. Therefore, after starting, it begins to tilt to the side and gradually increases this slope. Getting into orbit is a very difficult task, actually. The fuel should be enough to reach an insane speed of 18,000 miles per hour. That's why we invented this optimization method. Smart people call it gravitational reversal. So a rocket bends its trajectory after launch because it has to go into Earth's orbit. Congrats, that was a long journey. But now you, hopefully, learned a bit more about rocket launching. On the 2nd of September, 2023, India launched its first space probe to study the sun. This solar mission is called Aditla L1. It's going to travel almost 1 million miles and join four other spacecraft that are currently circling a point in space known as Lagrange Point 1. But this Indian mission is different from the rest. How come? Experts call this mission a unique observatory, all because it combines instruments that can shed light on not one, but on three crucial questions. The first one is how stars like our Sun sustain their insanely hot outer layer. The next mystery that confuses scientists is how exactly the Sun's magnetic field produces such severe solar storms. And the last one is how the variations in the magnetic field of our star affect the atmosphere of our planet. Aditla L1 has seven instruments that can help observe the layers of the Sun. For example, with the help of electromagnetic and particle detectors, the probe will examine the Sun's corona, which is the outer layer of the star. While doing it, the spacecraft will be hovering at a safe distance from the Sun, around 92 million miles. Researchers hope that the mission will be able to gather data on the properties of the corona and figure out what causes coronal mass ejections. Those are enormous bursts of electrons, ions, and magnetic fields. The probe is also expected to examine the Sun's lower atmosphere and the boundary between the atmosphere and the interior of the star. 
Everyone is waiting for the data from the mission with bated breath, especially from its Solar Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope. No wonder, it can help to study solar winds and the way they accelerate, as well as coronal heating. This telescope can also potentially provide images of the Sun's disk in the near ultraviolet for the first time ever. This disk is the outer visible layer of gas and dust surrounding the Sun. One of the mission's tasks is to help scientists figure out how the dynamics within the corona and the Sun's lower atmosphere drive space weather. You see, our star has a massive and pretty complex magnetic field which wanes and strengthens again, reaching its peak every 11 years or so. When it happens, the north and south poles of the field flip. The current cycle is predicted to reach its maximum in 2024 or 2025. It means that solar activity is going to keep rising in the next few years, making this period perfect for collecting data. There are five Lagrange points in space where the gravity between two bodies, in our case, between the Sun and Earth, cancels out. It means that a spaceship can remain there with minimal use of fuel. And L1, which is the goal of Adita L1, offers a great view of the Sun as a benefit. The Indian space probe is going to join four other craft orbiting L1. The satellite is supposed to reach its orbit in the middle of January, and by the end of February, scientists hope to start getting regular reports. The probe is expected to send around 1,440 images per day to the ground station, where these pictures will be analyzed. Adita L1 isn't the only spacecraft exploring the Sun. Probably the most famous one is NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Its main goal is to touch the Sun. It's flying closer to the surface of our star than any other spacecraft before. Astronomers hope that this mission will revolutionize our understanding of the Sun. For one thing, the distance between the probe and the surface of our star is more than seven times smaller than that between the Sun and any other spaceship. Plus, over seven years of hard work, Parker is supposed to complete 24 orbits around the Sun. And at its closest approach, the spacecraft will hang out around 3.9 million miles away from the Sun, which in this situation is very close. And its speed will be about 430,000 miles per hour. If you moved at this same speed, you'd get from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in just one second. The Parker Solar Probe has its instruments protected from the sun by a 4.5-inch thick carbon composite shield. It can withstand temperatures of around 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. But what exactly does the probe do? It dives into the scorching atmosphere of our star, having to withstand insane heat and radiation just to give us a glimpse of what this atmosphere is like. In 2021, NASA announced that the probe had flown through the corona, the sun's upper atmosphere. Parker managed to take samples of magnetic fields and particles there. It was the first time ever when a spaceship touched the sun. The probe was designed to travel within 4 million miles of the surface of our star, tracing the flow of energy, studying the heating of the corona, and exploring the acceleration of the solar wind. Hopefully, we'll get the answers to a few long-standing questions, like why is the sun's corona much hotter than the star's surface? What makes the solar wind accelerate? And what is the source of those high-energy solar particles? It's hard to believe, but we actually live in the sun's atmosphere. At first sight, our star looks like a bright self-contained sphere hanging out somewhere far away in space. But that visible edge is just the beginning. The sun's hot corona reaches way past Earth, all the way to Pluto and even beyond. You can't normally see this corona. It's visible only during a total eclipse. But believe me, it's there. The corona has its own weather. Billion-ton coronal mass ejections occur there. High-energy radiation storms rage from the sun's upper atmosphere. Relentless solar winds can reach a speed of a million miles per hour. And every comet, asteroid, and even planet in the solar system is affected by those elements. The Sun still has a lot of surprises for us. For example, recently, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory has discovered a large coronal hole in the southern part of our star's outer atmosphere. The temperature there can reach millions of degrees Fahrenheit. 
such giant coronal holes can have a dramatic impact on our planet. They mean that the sun produces and sends off streams of gas that can easily reach Earth. This can result in geomagnetic storms triggering disturbances in the atmosphere. At the same time, such solar flares also produce some of the most beautiful phenomena on Earth, the aurora borealis. But since the flares affect our planet's magnetic field, they can have an impact on GPS mapping, satellite television signals, and even cell phone transmission. How bad it gets depends on the intensity of solar flares. Another rather frequent occurrence of this natural phenomenon is power grid outages. Luckily, Earth's magnetic field does a great job protecting us from solar flares. But sometimes, the flares are just too powerful to go unnoticed. Some of them can release 10 million times more energy than the most powerful volcanic eruptions. Within a few minutes, one flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot. Their temperatures can reach several million degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the following news may sound scary, but there are also super flares. In comparison to them, our sun's bursts of radiation are small potatoes. Super flares mostly occur in young and active stars. In 2016, astronomers saw such a phenomenon. A star 1,500 light years away from Earth produced a flare that was 10 billion times more powerful than any of those that burst from our sun. It doesn't mean we're safe here on Earth. Even our middle-aged sun knows how to produce super flares. But while young stars can have them once a week or even more often, for the sun, it's once in a few thousand years. And still, if people don't figure out how to protect the planet, just one super flare can shred our ozone layer and wipe out life on Earth. Or not. Imagine flying in a spacecraft in a cloud of asteroids at high speed. You dodge one, one more, and then hit the gas pedal to the floor and crash into an asteroid at full speed on purpose. This is exactly what NASA is going to do in the near future. The entire mission will begin at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California on November 24th. Let's follow it step by step. So the Falcon 9 booster rocket is already on the launch pad. It's as tall as a 22-story building, or 11 giraffes. And it can get about 8 tons of cargo into orbit. So you could send a big elephant into space and a supply of food for it. Countdown. 3, 2, 1, ignition! Smoke clouds everywhere, and the rocket begins to gain altitude. Nine engines are working at full power to accelerate the rocket. At its peak, it reaches speeds 10 times faster than the speed of sound. And then the rocket engines shut down, and the rocket's first stage undocks to return to Earth. A couple of seconds later, the second stage receives the ignition command. It turns on its one engine and climbs even higher to orbit. The cargo capsule then opens and releases the DART spacecraft. DART stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Once released, the spaceship deploys two large solar panels. It'll convert solar energy into electrical energy to power a revolutionary ion engine. Conventional engines create thrust by burning tons of fuel and ejecting it outward. The rocket itself is essentially pushing off the emitted gases. The ion engine will not burn fuel. It'll use a strong electric field to accelerate the ionized gas. Like conventional rockets, it'll eject this gas and create thrust by repelling it. And though the ion engine produces less thrust, it can accelerate the spacecraft to higher speeds. So regular rocket engines have an excellent performance on the road. They push the pedal to the metal, burning a bunch of fuel, while the ion engine slowly accelerates. But when a conventional rocket needs to make a refueling stop, the ion spacecraft will whiz past the regular one at insane speeds. So the DART spacecraft begins its year-long journey. By comparison, a flight to Mars would take about seven months. Fast forward one year ahead, and we've arrived. This is the asteroid Didymos. The far point of its orbit is two astronomical units from our star. That's two Earth-Sun distances. At this point, the Sun begins to pull the asteroid back, and then it approaches the closest point to the star, one Earth-Sun distance. That is, its orbit lies very close to the orbit of our planet. Didymos made its closest approach to Earth at a distance of about 4.8 million miles. That's 20 times farther than the Moon's orbit. 
it takes 770 days to complete one such revolution around the sun. So Didymos is not considered a hazardous asteroid, but in the future, it'll approach the Earth even closer. And the consequences of a collision with it could be catastrophic, given its size. It's bigger than two Empire State Buildings, and it rotates at a rate of one revolution in two hours and 15 minutes. So it has a tremendous amount of energy. Plus, it has an asteroid companion. It's a small pebble 520 feet wide. It's like 12 school buses or 10 train cars. Its orbital period, that is, the time it takes the pebble to make a complete circle around the asteroid, is about 11.9 hours. NASA believes that asteroids up to 80 feet wide are likely to burn up completely in our atmosphere due to friction with the air, so they're not hazardous. Asteroids between 80 feet and half a mile in size will not burn completely and could cause severe damage. And asteroids over half a mile have the potential to wipe out large cities or even entire states. In that sense, we can consider Didymos potentially hazardous. So we're going to test one way of defending against asteroids on it, kinetic impact. That's why we sent DART here. So our spacecraft is going to hit an asteroid, only not its main body, but its little companion. DART is already moving toward it at about four miles per second. At that speed, a trip from New York to Washington DC would take less than a minute. And a trip across the United States from coast to coast would take about 10 minutes. DART is getting close. Three seconds to impact, two, one, bam! The spacecraft crashes into the asteroid at full speed. What are your predictions? Asteroid explodes and is blown to pieces? Or asteroid flies off the main body into space like a billiard ball? Well, scientists predict that this collision will reduce the speed of this small asteroid by a fraction of a percent, but it'll still be enough to reduce its orbital period by a few minutes. Then our telescopes on Earth will be able to study the effects of the collision in more detail. And to learn even more, we'll send another spacecraft to Didymos on another mission. This is Hera. It'll be launched in 2024 and is scheduled to arrive at Didymos around 2027. This spacecraft will carry a bunch of research equipment to assess the collision damage done by DART. When it arrives, Hera will take many pictures of the small asteroid, including a fresh impact crater. Hera will also be carrying two CubeSats. These are miniature space probes, smaller than a shoebox. It'll launch these mini satellites, and they will make an even closer approach to the asteroid. They will study this space rock for three to six months. At the end of the mission, one of them will attempt to land on the asteroid's surface to learn even more about its composition and internal structure. It's also possible Hera will carry a mini impactor. This thing will have to make another impact on the asteroid. Then scientists will be able to evaluate the difference in impacts with a large spacecraft and a small one, and understand how we can defend against asteroids in the future. In theory, we don't need to send a giant rocket to a dangerous asteroid to destroy it. A single strike might be enough to shift the trajectory of the asteroid slightly. On a cosmic scale, changing the trajectory, even by a fraction, would dramatically change the asteroid's finish point. But kinetic impact is not the only way to deal with hazardous asteroids. Check out the gravity tractor. For this technique, we need to send a spacecraft toward the asteroid too. Only it won't crash into it. It'll have to go into its orbit. Any asteroid has a force of attraction, and it'll pull the spacecraft toward it. But the spacecraft's engines will keep it at the same altitude. So the asteroid itself will start attracting to the spacecraft. This method is reliable enough but it takes a long time. And it'll only work if we detect a potentially hazardous asteroid many years before it arrives at Earth. We should have enough time to send a spacecraft to the asteroid and then carry out an asteroid tractor technique. The other option is a laser. When an asteroid is found, we need to aim a powerful laser beam at it. It'll heat up a certain point on the asteroid, causing the material there to evaporate. This is where physics comes into play. The material on the asteroid evaporates upwards. It makes the asteroid itself move downward. Just like our rocket engines work, the burning fuel is ejected one way and the spacecraft moves the other. We can also use solar power instead of lasers. To do that, we need to build a big space station, which would be equipped with a lot of magnifying glasses. Have you ever tried to burn letters on a wooden surface with a magnifying glass? Well, we'd be doing the same thing, but with an asteroid. The space station will have to focus lots of the sun's rays into one point on the asteroid. 
Again, the material evaporates because of the high temperature, and this causes the asteroid to change its trajectory slightly so that it flies past our planet. How about foil? That's right, we can avoid a collision with an asteroid by using ordinary foil. We would have to wrap the asteroid in the same reflective material. Then the asteroid won't absorb the sun's rays, but will instead reflect them. This creates a little pressure on the surface of the asteroid. It's as if the sun's rays are pushing the asteroid, and it'll be able to change its trajectory. And not the most obvious but reliable option is conventional rocket engines. We can put several powerful engines on the asteroid. This would create thrust and change the trajectory of the asteroid. And if there are enough engines, we can even take control of the asteroid. So when a bigger space rock appears on the horizon, we'll turn on our engines and point the asteroid straight at it. Such a collision can completely destroy even a very large asteroid. And it would make for one epic light show. Traveling to space costs a fortune, but there's a way to make it affordable. You step into an elevator, push the button, and voila, you're flying to the stars, all thanks to nanotubes. But then something hits the elevator on the way. You're stuck inside, and now you're doomed to float in space forever. Now, if you want to travel in space, get ready to shell out around 55 million bucks. But in the near future, you'll probably be able to travel to space with just the push of a button without breaking the bank. Because space elevators might come into play. While the idea of galactic lifts seems like something out of a sci-fi movie, it is a real possibility that could revolutionize space travel. With an estimated cost of $8 billion, space elevators could be a one-time investment that would last us forever. NASA alone spends around $2.7 million on rocket fuel per minute. To launch a rocket, they need to pay up to $178 million. These costs could be significantly reduced with the use of elevators. Most super-tall buildings on Earth have a massive foundation to help with their balance and weight. As you look up, they get thinner and thinner. Even the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, is massive at the bottom and narrow at the top. If we wanted to construct something like a gigantic lift, we would need an enormous amount of concrete to build a foundation for it, which goes against the point of saving some cash. Now, get a string, tie a ball at the end of it, and start spinning it. The string in your hand will stay in one place, and the ball will revolve around your hand. This is called centrifugal force, and the elevator will work in the same way. The ball will be the base in space, and the rope will hang toward Earth. The station from where we would enter the elevator would be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and the line would extend from there. For this to be possible, the line must be perfectly synchronized with Earth's rotation. Otherwise, it would simply break or wrap around the Earth like a scarf. Also, the orbit the line would be following should be a perfect circle, because the line wouldn't be able to get shorter or extend. A bunch of research has been done using algebra to find the ideal solution. Wait a second, there's a use for algebra? Never mind. Meanwhile, I won't bore you with the math. We'll go straight to the point where the precise distance from the station in the Atlantic to the one in space must be 22,236 miles above the Earth, where the geosynchronous orbit starts. There, the four outward forces are much stronger than the downward force. That's why the station would stay in one place. When you construct a house or a building, you start from the bottom going up. But to create this engineering wonder, we would need to do everything in reverse and start at the top. The main problem here would be the weight. If the line was too heavy, it would disrupt the orbit, and the conveyor dumbwaiter host would not work. So we need to balance the station in space to ensure it worked flawlessly. Steel is one of the most robust materials on Earth. The cable in every lift is made from steel. But when you need a 22,236-mile-long cable, hmm, things can get tricky. Steel is hard to break, but it's cumbersome. And when you have to use a lot of it, problems start to arise. We use heavy steel a lot in construction, but we have lighter materials that might put less stress on the station and eliminate this problem. Also, the line would have to be tapered because, at the end point, there would be close to zero stress but it would still have to be thicker than really needed due to a bunch of safety factors. 
At the start, the rope would be around 0.5 inches. After using some complicated math, we can figure out the thickness at the end, which is a number so long I am unable to pronounce it. But believe me, it's a big one. So, steel is off the list. Another candidate is Kevlar, which is five times stronger than steel. And if we added such materials as carbon and titanium into the mix, the strength would increase tenfold. The line would have a diameter of around 262 to 557 feet. This is drastically smaller than the diameter of the steel cable could be. The bad news is that doing this is too pricey. So if we don't find the ideal medium to build a cable, the idea of the space elevator will just be a massive waste of time. If only we had some magically light material with a power of 60 gigapascals, which would have a taper ratio of 1.6. Oh wait, we actually do have this unique material. It's called carbon nanotube. It has a strength of 130 gigapascals, which is much more than we need. Nanotubes are made out of carbon and are 100,000 times thinner than a human hair. This material is solid and has good conductive power, which is possible thanks to its unique atomic structure. We use this product in many things, from batteries to optics, and it can be modified entirely and adapted for more uses. Bradley Edwards is the guy responsible for this crazy idea. NASA was looking for new innovations, and they said, don't do anything too crazy and start building a space hoist. I guess Bradley took this as a challenge and started working on the elevator. Edwards wrote a paper about a galactic conveyor. When he published it, he expected many people to find flaws in his work. But surprisingly, nobody did. His work was spot on. He came up with the idea of strapping a nanotube line to a rocket and launching it into space. The other end of the rope would fall onto Earth, and robots would use this rope to climb up and make it longer so we could start building an elevator space station. After this, the elevator could start transporting everything, from solar panels to tourists. In the future, space tourism could be totally possible. Who knows? We might even go on vacations in space. Hey, looking for some atmosphere for your getaway? Well, don't come here, we don't have any. Oops, probably not a good advertising slogan, huh? Meanwhile, a couple of years ago, we could only create microscopic carbon nanotubes. But as time went on, much more research was done to make them bigger. Now they reach up to a few inches. In 20 years, they could be miles long. Carbon costs $28 per ounce. If we do the math, we would see that we would need around $1 billion to build a lift. Yeah, it sounds expensive, but it's a long-term solution to space travel, and it can actually save us a lot of money in the long run. Now, everything looks perfect on paper. But NASA's main reason why they chose not to go along with this project is that right now, there are probably more than 128 million objects floating in orbit, and they might pose a real threat to the elevator. The lift could be made to withstand a few hits now and then, but getting hammered nonstop is not part of the plan. Still, Bradley argues that tons of monitoring devices track space debris. Thus, the elevator could avoid them all. Now, if something hit the elevator or the line somehow broke, the consequences would not be too bad. If there were no passengers on board, of course. If the line got cut, the elevator would simply float away into space, posing no threat to people on Earth. In Japan, engineers are trying to build a space elevator. The lift could be used for space mining, too. We could easily cover the cost of the entire elevator by collecting asteroids, because some of them are made of expensive metals. We could mine them and quickly bring them back to Earth. Have you ever tried riding your bike over nails? I guess it wasn't your intention, but if it happened at least once, you don't want to live through that experience again. Now imagine you'd have to ride your bike on Mars. Its surface is covered with rocks, canyons, volcanoes, dry lake beds, craters, and red dust. That combo makes those nails look totally harmless. No wheels we use down on Earth will do the trick. So NASA has been working on developing the perfect ones for use on the Moon or Mars since the 1960s. They tried smooth rubber tires with inner tubes full of nitrogen, large flexible wire mesh wheels, and airless compliant tires made of several hundred coiled steel wires. The spring tire, 
but nothing was good enough for the challenging cosmic terrains. The wheels of Mars Curiosity rover only lasted a bit over a year before they got seriously damaged. The rover's tires faced two big problems. First, they had to be strong enough to carry the enormous weight of the vehicle. Engineers tried to make it the most efficient vehicle for exploration, different from previous models that worked on the Moon and on Mars before it. That's how it ended up being so heavy. A big, heavy car needs durable tires, you know. And of course, the surface of Mars is no walk in the park. The engineers tried to make tires out of aluminum, which is a lightweight and strong material, but the wheels got shredded soon. The damage didn't prevent Curiosity from doing its job, but it did affect how efficient it was. And that's where the new, reinvented wheel rolled in. NASA decided to replace aluminum with a material called Shape Memory Alloy. It's made of a unique type of metal called nitinol, a blend of nickel and titanium. Unlike other materials that bend out of shape under pressure or heat, this cool substance reverts back to its original shape on its own in the same circumstances. Nitinol is the hero up on Mars, but it's also useful down on Earth. Just imagine your tires never getting punctured again. Sounds good to me. One company decided to use this tech on their bikes. The tires are tube-shaped and squashed down when you roll over a bump. They will develop perfect shape memory over time. They're supposed to work best on gravel, trail, and mountain bikes. The metal surface is covered with a rubbery outer layer. When it wears off eventually, the company plans to retread the tires to make them last for years. The previous airless tire models were made of patented foam that was supposed to last for up to 5,000 miles. They didn't take off because they made the bike too heavy. The new model is supposed to solve that problem. Nitinol also works great in the field of heart surgery. Tubes made of it can expand to the desired width under certain temperatures in the human body. The tire isn't the only object that works better with shape memory. If you can't imagine your sleep without that comfy memory foam mattress, you can send a thank you note to NASA for it. Its history goes back to 1966, when they decided to customize seats for astronauts to somehow ease the effects of G-force on takeoff and landing. Creating a custom seat for every flight seemed way too impractical, so memory foam saved the day. It easily adjusted to astronauts' body shape and went back into a rest state when not in use. In the 1980s, it went from space down to the earthly public. Now it's in mattresses, pillows, amusement park rides, horseback saddles, and football helmet liners. The third generation memory foam has gel particles and visco foam inside. That's the secret to its superpower of reducing trapped body heat, springing back up in no time, and making the mattress feel soft as a cloud. The name says it all, but in case you ever had your doubts, space blankets were indeed invented by NASA with space in mind. Back in the 1960s, they were preparing for the space era and looking for a thin, reflective, metallic material that would protect their spaceships from solar radiation. And they managed to design just the perfect material empiette, strong enough to be used as insulation to protect expensive space electronics from temperature swings. Ever since, it has been an important part of nearly every mission to and beyond the orbit of our planet. It's also used in spacesuits to protect astronauts from radiation and the sun's heat once they venture into open space. Down on Earth, space blankets are the best friends of marathon runners. Since body temperature drops after they stop running, they need something to help bring it back to normal. And the magical space blanket material can also protect your phone from extreme heat and cold when used as an insulation layer in a phone case. In the early 1960s, headsets for airline pilots used to be really bulky. They often had to use handheld mics to communicate. NASA needed a more reliable and lightweight technology for their missions to make sure the communication would go without any problems. In 1961, the Liberty Bell 7 capsule splashed down and astronaut Gus Grissom nearly sank without radio transmission or contact with his recovery team. NASA reached out to a manufacturing company to design a headset that could be planted into an astronaut's helmet. Just 11 days later, the team came up with a microphone headset unit that could be used by astronauts to communicate with one another and with Earth. It even had a noise-canceling feature. The headset was later improved and used for Mercury and Apollo missions. The world was able to hear Neil Armstrong's most famous phrase as he landed on the moon thanks to that wireless headset. 
freeze-drying tech for food was not created but greatly improved by NASA to pack more snacks on long Apollo missions. During the first human missions, astronauts had to eat bite-sized cubes, freeze-dried powders, and squeeze semi-liquids out of aluminum tubes. Doesn't sound like a festive meal, right? The astronauts weren't happy about this diet, so NASA had to think of a better solution for the Gemini missions. They funded research that ended in developing special gravies that could go into edible shape in hot water in just five minutes. The idea of freeze-drying is to cook food, then freeze it under low pressure, and then slowly heat it in a vacuum chamber to remove ice crystals. Thanks to this tech, food maintains 98% of its nutritional value, with only 20% of its original weight. NASA kept improving the tech in the following decades. Now, freeze-dried food is a great help for backpackers, disaster relief programs, and anyone who needs to pack light and still get proper nutrition. The infrared thermometer that lets us check temperature from a distance was developed with the support of NASA as well. It measures thermal radiation emitted by your eardrum, a lot like they measure the temperature of stars and planets. Each device has a lens that focuses light from the object onto a special detector that converts radiation into an electrical signal and then into temperature that you can see on a display. It's used for many purposes, from monitoring hotspot temperatures in mechanical and electrical systems to checking the temperature of visitors in public places. I bet you didn't see this one coming. The technology behind selfies comes from that designed for interplanetary missions cameras. In the 1990s, one of NASA labs, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, introduced a light mini imaging system that didn't need a lot of energy to take high quality photos from space. This tech is used in cell phone and computer cameras. And if we go back to the 1960s, we'll find some good evidence that the whole idea of selfies could belong to astronauts. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, took some selfies up there with a specially designed Hasselblad camera. He even used the spacecraft as a tripod to stabilize the image and get his face in it. Remember this if you ever end up in space with no one to take photos of you. Spacesuits are made of many different materials, elements, and functioning mechanisms for them to protect you in the vacuum of space. <laughs> Good thing. The freezing temperatures and lack of oxygen aren't suitable for any living being to float around without any sort of protection on, not to mention the burning sun rays and potential objects that can crash into you. The uh, technical term for a spacesuit is extravehicular mobility units, and they're extremely durable and expensive to make, with each suit costing up to $10.4 million to make. Each spacesuit is custom-made, with each part and component created and manufactured by 80 different companies. The size of each piece may vary, so it can either fit in the palm of your hand or be as large as 30 inches. The suit has 18 separate items and 16 layers covering it. Well, in reality, there are 14, but if the two internal layers are added, it will be 16 in total. So there. Spacesuits have evolved over the decades to be the design it is today, a mini spaceship in human form. It's built to mimic the living conditions of Earth's atmosphere, so that the astronauts can't be exposed to space. It has a system to support oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. It's durable enough to protect the astronauts from solar radiation, harsh sunlight, and little micrometeoroids. The conditions inside our atmosphere can be extremely tough, which is why it has internal temperature control for the bodies and a pressurized enclosure. The temperatures outside the suit can be as hot as 250 degrees Fahrenheit ouch, to minus 250 degrees. <laughs> it's designed to support life for anyone outside our atmosphere. The main piece of the suit is a cooling garment made out of nylon, stretchy spandex fibers, and liquid tubes. It's delicately designed to fit around 300 feet of tubes woven tightly together in clothing that occupies the whole body, except the head, feet, and hands. It uses chilled water to flow through the many tubes near the skin to regulate the body temperature and cool it down while spacewalking. Think of it like a fan in a laptop that's made to cool it down when it overheats. The whole garment is attached to the life support system. Now, the life support system is one of the most important pieces of the suit and requires meticulous effort to put together. Everything in this compartment is important to keep the astronaut alive in space. Any miscalculation can be devastating and even life-threatening. It houses the pressurized oxygen tanks when they're filled and sealed tight. 
The oxygen tank can provide up to 7 hours of fresh air to breathe. There's also a secondary tank that adds around 30 minutes of breathing time. Astronauts can't afford to waste oxygen all the time while wearing the suit, so it's important that they strategically allocate those breaths. There's also the carbon dioxide removal device, which includes a filter canister made of lithium hydroxide that's also attached to a tube. That way, there won't be any toxic carbon dioxide circulating inside of the headpiece, and it will always purify the air inside. Next to it is a ventilation fan to cool the astronaut when moving. Wearing a heavy suit isn't easy and requires a lot of physical effort to move. Even though gravity is weaker up there, you still have to move your arms and legs, which can be tiresome over time. There's also a source of electrical power and a two-way radio to communicate with the base. And just in case something happens, a warning system is installed to warn the astronaut of failures in the system. Uh Uh-oh. Finally, there's the water cooling equipment to keep the body cool and regulated. After the life support system is put together, it's attached to the hard upper torso part. The helmet on spacesuits, built for spacewalks, serves as a pressure bubble and is made of strong plastic to keep the pressure of the suit contained. There's a neck ring to keep it airlocked in place and a ventilation system to provide oxygen to the astronaut. And there's also a connection to a backup oxygen tank, just in case. While the astronauts are working in space, they might crave a little bit of water or something. Good thing there's a built-in straw for them to drink from. And also, while working in open space, there's that annoying sun that shines into your eyes. A visor is installed to protect the astronaut from the sun that's made of a gold coating. And what's a spacesuit helmet without a camera to record everything? Since the two-way radio is connected to the life support system, the headphones and microphone are placed in the chin strap where the astronaut can communicate with the base. Space can be dark at times, yeah, most of the time. So, there's an inbuilt light bar used when operating on close-up objects. Continuing our space fashion show gala, over at the lower torso unit, we have the pants and boots area. There's also a knee to ankle and waist connection, comprising of a pressure bladder and a specially coated nylon. Most of it is made out of different elements and materials to keep it usable and durable in space missions, as well as providing stylish evening wear for that astronaut who goes out at night. You can adjust the size of the rings of the thigh and leg sections whenever you want. This is good when the astronaut is walking and needs to feel relaxed at certain times. The astronaut also wears thermal socks under the hiking-style boots, which have a heat retention system built in to keep those tootsies warm and cozy. The upper torso is hard yet lightweight. It's made out of metal and fiberglass, connecting the inside of the suit to the life support system. It resembles a t-shirt, but attaches to the arm assembly, which stretches to the arms up over the wrist. There's also a special connection to the helmet ring piece. Over here, you can find water reservoir tanks, oxygen cans, and much other technical stuff needed for outer space. The newer spacesuits have a hatch in the back for the astronauts to climb in and enter the suit. How stylish! A control module in the chest area allows the astronaut to check up on the external conditions and monitor the fluids and electricity. The gloves are sturdy enough to protect the astronauts when touching and picking up objects while working outside the space station. They're built so well that they can move each finger with ease. They're the part of the body that gets cold fast in space, so the gloves have a heater system to keep them warm. The process of creating a spacesuit requires so many steps and details, so it's not like sewing together a sweater. It starts with a design integration and then modeling. That way, they can see what it looks like without gathering the materials to build it. And once the design is confirmed, they begin gathering all the materials, which can take some time. And when everything is gathered, they begin the fabrication and building, which can also take time. A total of seven different parts will be created and shipped to NASA for assembly. When an astronaut goes outside the International Space Station, they must have a safety strap attached to them that connects to the station. That way, they won't float away while doing some maintenance work. The longest spacewalk lasted a total of 8 hours and 56 minutes, and the suits have come a long way. During the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong couldn't walk on the moon properly, even though, technically, he was the first to walk on the moon. He actually did some bunny hops. But with the newer innovations and technologies, astronauts can walk and turn their hips in space. 
NASA plans on going back to the moon by 2024 and is preparing two new spacesuits with better technology and dexterity. It's called the Zemo, and it's based on the current design of what astronauts wear on the International Space Station. But the new designs and features will allow humans to live and work on the moon. A demonstration showed how flexible it is compared to the previous ones. You can twist and bend at the waist. The legwear section is better for walking on the moon's surface. Minor changes include no zippers or cables to keep out the dust. On August 20th, 1977, the most ambitious space mission took off from Earth. The main goal of Voyager 2 was to study the outer solar system up close. It became possible because of a rare alignment of planets. Voyager 2 was supposed to study all the gas giants of the solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Astronomers also hoped it would be able to find and explore the edge of the solar system. Since Voyager 2 was built for interstellar travel, the probe was equipped with a large 12-foot-wide antenna. It allowed the spaceship to send the data it gathered back to Earth. During its journey, the space probe discovered a 14th moon of Jupiter. Voyager 2 was the only spaceship to study all four giant planets from up close. It was the first human-made object to fly past Uranus, where it found two new rings and ten new moons. Voyager 2 also flew by Neptune and noticed its great dark spot. That's a colossal spinning storm in the planet's southern hemisphere. The storm is the size of Earth and moves at a speed of 1,500 miles per hour. These winds are the strongest ever recorded on any planet of the solar system. In the history of space exploration, only five spacecraft have managed to leave the gravitational pull of the solar system. Those were Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons. People launch thousands of objects into space. These objects easily overcome Earth's gravity. But the Sun is around 300,000 times as massive as our home planet. That's why its gravitational pull is way more difficult to find. Even more impressively, Voyager 2 is the second human-made object in history to reach the space between stars after passing through the heliosphere. That's a bubble of magnetic fields and particles produced by the Sun and protecting the solar system. Two years after its launch, Voyager 2 started transmitting the first images of Jupiter. The space probe provided scientists with much-needed information about Io and Europa, some of the largest of Jupiter's moons. Then the space mission passed by the gas giant itself. The distance between the spacecraft and the planet was around 400,000 miles. That's when the probe noticed some changes in the shape and color of the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous, long-lived storm system, like a hurricane on Earth, but much, much larger. Two years later, Voyager 2 reached Saturn. It discovered spokes and kinks in some of the planet's rings. While the spacecraft was flying behind and up past the gas giant, it passed through the plane of Saturn's rings. At that time, Voyager's speed was around 8 miles per second. For several minutes, the probe was hit by thousands of micron-sized grains of dust. This kept shifting the probe's direction, and its control jets had to fire many times to stabilize the vehicle. After Voyager 2 explored Uranus and Neptune, it headed out of the solar system. Its instruments were put in low power to save energy. In August 2007, the spacecraft passed the terminal shot. It's the boundary marking the outer limit of the sun's influence. Here, the solar wind slows down. In the summer of 2013, the probe reached interstellar space. Now, when it comes to sending and receiving signals in space, there are three factors you should keep in mind – distance, power, and time. The farther away a spacecraft is, the farther a signal has to travel before it reaches it and the longer it takes for this signal to catch up with the spacecraft. And when it finally gets there, it's extremely weak. Another problem is that once the spacecraft is launched, it can't be upgraded. It's literally stuck with the technology it was outfitted with. Plus, such spaceships as Voyager 2 are powered by radioactive fuel. When special material radioactively decays, it releases heat that gets converted into electricity. Unfortunately, the more material decays away, the less power the spacecraft has for receiving and transmitting radio signals. Despite this issue, we haven't lost the connection with Voyager 1 and 2. That's because new and more powerful technologies appear on Earth. 
signals people send can reach much farther than before. That's why it was possible to stay in touch with Voyager 2, which entered interstellar space in 2018 and has already traveled almost 12 billion miles away from Earth. But in March 2020, the main piece of equipment that allowed scientists to exchange signals with the spaceship was switched off. After the communication with the spacecraft stopped, NASA spent around 11 months upgrading its deep space network and installing new hardware. The DSN is an international array of huge radio antennas that help astronomers on Earth communicate with interplanetary missions. These antennas are located in California, Madrid, and Canberra. The one used to keep in touch with Voyager 2 is a 230-foot wide dish in Canberra. This is the only equipment that can send commands that can reach the probe. This antenna, known as DSS-43, started operating in 1972, five years before Voyager 2 and 1 were launched. At that time, it was only 210 feet across. Since then, the dish has received a lot of repairs and upgrades. But these 11 months were the longest the antenna was offline. In October 2020, the antenna was finally ready for a trial after all the upgrades and repairs. The mission operator sent a set of commands to Voyager 2, and after many months of radio silence, the spacecraft returned the signal. The probe confirmed it had heard the call. After that, the spacecraft carried out the commands. While the dish was offline, the mission operators could actually receive scientific data and health updates from Voyager 2. Astronomers kept getting data from interstellar space, the region outside the Sun's heliosphere. But they couldn't send any commands to the probe, since it had traveled too far away from Earth. The upgraded antenna received two new radio transmitters, and it was done just in time. One of the transmitters, that was used to communicate with Voyager 2, hadn't been replaced in almost 50 years. The antenna also got new cooling and heating equipment and other electronics necessary to support the advanced transmitters. Now, a curious thing about the Deep Space Network is that its radio antennas are positioned in a very precise way. They're spaced equally around the globe. This way, almost any spacecraft can stay in touch with at least one facility at all times. But Voyager 2 is an exception. In 1989, it made a close flyby of Triton, Neptune's moon. It was the only close encounter people had with the eighth planet of the solar system and its moon. By the way, Triton is the largest known object that is believed to be born in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring around the Sun full of icy objects. Voyager 2 discovered Neptune's ring system and its tiny inner moons. The probe also gathered a lot of amazing information about Triton. For example, it became clear that the moon is covered in cryovolcanoes. Instead of spewing molten rock, these volcanoes spit ice consisting of water, ammonia, and methane. When the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto more than 25 years later, it discovered the same phenomenon on the dwarf planet. Anyway, to make this detour, Voyager 2 had to travel over the gas giant's North Pole. But this changed the probe's trajectory, deflecting it southward relative to the planes of the planets. Since then, Voyager 2 has been moving in that direction. And now, the spacecraft is so far away that it's out of reach of the radio antennas in the Northern Hemisphere, those in Madrid and California. This makes DSS-43, which is located in the Southern Hemisphere, the only dish powerful enough in broadcasting just the right frequency to send commands to Voyager 2. Voyager 1, the probe's faster-traveling twin, didn't change its trajectory. After passing by Saturn, it took a different path. That's why now it can easily communicate with the two facilities in the Northern Hemisphere. The upgrade the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex has gone through can also benefit other space missions. For example, the Mars Perseverance rover that landed on the Red Planet on February 18, 2021. The dish will also be crucial for exploring other planets and the Moon. Spacesuits are made of many different materials, elements, and functioning mechanisms for them to protect you in the vacuum of space. <laughs> Good thing. The freezing temperatures and lack of oxygen aren't suitable for any living being to float around without any sort of protection on, not to mention the burning sun rays and potential objects that can crash into you. The uh, technical term for a spacesuit is extravehicular mobility units, and they're extremely durable and expensive to make, with each suit costing up to $10.4 million to make. 
Each spacesuit is custom-made, with each part and component created and manufactured by 80 different companies. The size of each piece may vary, so it can either fit in the palm of your hand or be as large as 30 inches. The suit has 18 separate items and 16 layers covering it. Well, (laughs) in reality, there are 14, but if the two internal layers are added, it will be 16 in total. So there. Spacesuits have evolved over the decades to be the design it is today, a mini spaceship in human form. It's built to mimic the living conditions of Earth's atmosphere, so that the astronauts can't be exposed to space. It has a system to support oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. It's durable enough to protect the astronauts from solar radiation, harsh sunlight, and little micrometeoroids. The conditions inside our atmosphere can be extremely tough which is why it has internal temperature control for the bodies and a pressurized enclosure. The temperatures outside the suit can be as hot as 250 degrees Fahrenheit, ouch, to minus 250 degrees. It's designed to support life for anyone outside our atmosphere. The main piece of the suit is a cooling garment made out of nylon, stretchy spandex fibers, and liquid tubes. It's delicately designed to fit around 300 feet of tubes woven tightly together in clothing that occupies the whole body, except the head, feet, and hands. It uses chilled water to flow through the many tubes near the skin to regulate the body temperature and cool it down while spacewalking. Think of it like a fan in a laptop that's made to cool it down when it overheats. The whole garment is attached to the life support system. Now, the life support system is one of the most important pieces of the suit and requires meticulous effort to put together. Everything in this compartment is important to keep the astronaut alive in space. Any miscalculation can be devastating and even life-threatening. It houses the pressurized oxygen tanks when they're filled and sealed tight. The oxygen tank can provide up to 7 hours of fresh air to breathe. There's also a secondary tank that adds around 30 minutes of breathing time. Astronauts can't afford to waste oxygen all the time while wearing the suit. So it's important that they strategically allocate those breaths. There's also the carbon dioxide removal device, which includes a filter canister made of lithium hydroxide that's also attached to a tube. That way, there won't be any toxic carbon dioxide circulating inside of the headpiece, and it will always purify the air inside. Next to it is a ventilation fan to cool the astronaut when moving. Wearing a heavy suit isn't easy and requires a lot of physical effort to move. Even though gravity is weaker up there, you still have to move your arms and legs, which can be tiresome over time. There's also a source of electrical power and a two-way radio to communicate with the base. And just in case something happens, a warning system is installed to warn the astronaut of failures in the system. Uh Uh-oh. Finally, there's the water cooling equipment to keep the body cool and regulated. After the life support system is put together, it's attached to the hard upper torso part. The helmet on spacesuits, built for spacewalks, serves as a pressure bubble and is made of strong plastic to keep the pressure of the suit contained. There's a neck ring to keep it airlocked in place and a ventilation system to provide oxygen to the astronaut. And there's also a connection to a backup oxygen tank, just in case. While the astronauts are working in space, they might crave a little bit of water or something. Good thing there's a built-in straw for them to drink from. And also, while working in open space, there's that annoying sun that shines into your eyes. A visor is installed to protect the astronaut from the sun that's made of a gold coating. And what's a spacesuit helmet without a camera to record everything? Since the two-way radio is connected to the life support system, the headphones and microphone are placed in the chin strap where the astronaut can communicate with the base. Space can be dark at times, yeah, most of the time. So, there's an inbuilt light bar used when operating on close-up objects. Continuing our space fashion show gala, over at the lower torso unit, we have the pants and boots area. There's also a knee to ankle and waist connection, comprising of a pressure bladder and a specially coated nylon. Most of it is made out of different elements and materials to keep it usable and durable in space missions, as well as providing stylish evening wear for that astronaut who goes out at night. You can adjust the size of the rings of the thigh and leg sections whenever you want. This is good when the astronaut is walking and needs to feel relaxed at certain times. The astronaut also wears thermal socks under the hiking-style boots, which have a heat retention system built in to keep those tootsies warm and cozy. The upper torso is hard yet lightweight. 
It's made out of metal and fiberglass, connecting the inside of the suit to the life support system. It resembles a t-shirt, but attaches to the arm assembly, which stretches to the arms up over the wrist. There's also a special connection to the helmet ring piece. Over here, you can find water reservoir tanks, oxygen cans, and much other technical stuff needed for outer space. The newer spacesuits have a hatch in the back for the astronauts to climb in and enter the suit. How stylish! A control module in the chest area allows the astronaut to check up on the external conditions and monitor the fluids and electricity. The gloves are sturdy enough to protect the astronauts when touching and picking up objects while working outside the space station. They're built so well that they can move each finger with ease. They're the part of the body that gets cold fast in space, so the gloves have a heater system to keep them warm. The process of creating a spacesuit requires so many steps and details, so it's not like sewing together a sweater. It starts with a design integration and then modeling. That way, they can see what it looks like without gathering the materials to build it. And once the design is confirmed, they begin gathering all the materials, which can take some time. And when everything is gathered, they begin the fabrication and building, which can also take time. A total of seven different parts will be created and shipped to NASA for assembly. When an astronaut goes outside the International Space Station, they must have a safety strap attached to them that connects to the station. That way, they won't float away while doing some maintenance work. The longest spacewalk lasted a total of 8 hours and 56 minutes, and the suits have come a long way. During the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong couldn't walk on the moon properly, even though, technically, he was the first to walk on the moon. He actually did some bunny hops. But with the newer innovations and technologies, astronauts can walk and turn their hips in space. NASA plans on going back to the moon by 2024 and is preparing two new spacesuits with better technology and dexterity. It's called the Zemo, and it's based on the current design of what astronauts wear on the International Space Station. But the new designs and features will allow humans to live and work on the moon. A demonstration showed how flexible it is compared to the previous ones. You can twist and bend at the waist. The legwear section is better for walking on the moon's surface. Minor changes include no zippers or cables to keep out the dust. 